And now we are, we are going to continue with session two, which will be dedicated to the pilot actions. And the first presentation of this session will be uh, given by uh, Anna Soleil of the Iris Seaweed Consultancy. And she is going to tell us about their trial with uh, Imantaria Elongata. Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Anna Soler, and I am representing the IDC with Consultancy. Uh, we are a partner in the Integrate project, and we are one of the two SMEs involved in this project. Today, I'm going to speak about talk about Imantelia, the cultivation of Imantelia elongata, also known as sea spaghetti, and the first trials on an INTA farm uh, in Ireland. Uh, this is in within the pilot action one, which the aim was to test new eco-friendly technology and high-value seaweeds applied to IMTA. Out of these will be two outputs that you will find online in the next few weeks, uh, two technical guides, one on benthic IMTA development and a second one on a, spe a species developing the project. Also will be a paper in a peer review scientific journal that will be on the uh, topic of this presentation. Uh, why sea spaghetti? Sea uh, spaghetti was one of the 10 macroalgae species that uh, France uh, authorized to be used as a food and uh, has been also hand harvested in many of the uh, Atlantic area European countries. Um, Imantelia longata is the scientific name and the common name is sea spaghetti, although also it is known as sea bean or tom wheat and have many different Irish names. It's a brown algae closely related to the wax. Uh, the fronts are flat and can be up to three and a half meters long and up to eight millimeters wide. This picture here is what usually you find on the shore, is this yellow brown colored uh, long and flexible um, uh, uh, tongues or also got uh, named as receptacles. The sea spaghetti growing stages are very visual and interesting. You first find these uh, small buttons on the shore, uh, these germlings that expand and uh, uh, go through different uh, stages. Uh, it goes next to a, uh, then to a button a stage that expands laterally and becomes the mushroom a stage. It's more the uh, picture on the right, number two. And then at the end, it produces this tongue-like receptacle in picture number three, uh, that is the receptacle stage. Uh, the three first stages, uh, it's what is the vegetative talus in the, in the order focales. After the, the long fertile receptacle is the fertile section of the, of the plant. Uh, Imantelia has a direct life cycle, which means that uh, in the wild you find female plants and um, male plants, and each one of them produce their own fertile, uh, uh, their own reproductive material. Uh, this happens in the conceptacles, that is, there are these little dots that you see on the actual uh, receptacles. The actual uh, work that we have done uh, during the Integrate project, uh, when we started, we had uh, no experience uh, with this species, and there is very little work done uh, previously on cultivating Imantelia uh, on a bigger scale. Um, so we started observing the plants on the shore and uh, from late 2017 and then from January, February, March 2018, we collected uh, the first uh, plants and we start measuring 10 plants every month and try to understand the length and the weight. We were bringing them back into the lab and uh, with that, we will uh, do some sections and go into the conceptacle, understand uh, the sex differentiation, the number of eggs, the size. In here, you can see uh, a female uh, conceptacle on the left hand side with a very visible X, round X, and on the on the right hand side, you see a conceptacle of a, of a male plant. Um, we could uh, fully differentiate all plants from June onwards. And every single month, we tried to release some eggs in the lab, uh, but it didn't happen until August 2018, when actually the plants uh, release naturally their eggs. Uh, 
from that moment on, we did continuous assays to try the length of dehydration, length of release, filtration. Uh, we compared moon phases. Um, and it was a continuous number of essays because we wanted to understand in a very short time the, the, main, uh, the main characteristics and how to succeed uh, in order to bring them at, at sea. Uh, that was challenging because we, we weren't sure of every single step. Um, we also try uh, different attachments, uh, substrates, and it proved uh, that the scallop shell was a very good unit because, as you can see in, the, in this picture, uh, the eggs are visible very clear from day one when they are released. Uh, is a single unit that we could replicate. And also we could make this tiny hole on the top and we could, that would be already thinking to bring them at sea and the way to attach them uh, on the ropes. Um, throughout all the experimental work, we took images. And in this way, uh, later on, we have analyzed the images on image J and that uh, by superimposing a grid, uh, it allows to select the same sections uh, through time and be able to uh, uh, analyze the number of X, uh, the area, or the actual growth uh, through time. All this is at the moment being uh, written in a manuscript and we hope in the next month to be available. And finally, uh, when we had a, a good number of uh, shells, and we were quite certain about the method uh, we were developing, uh, we brought uh, the shells to uh, an IMTA farm uh, located in Lehana in Connemara, County Galway. This is a farm uh, managed by the Marine Institute and it's a great facility uh, for, uh, for testing uh, all this, uh, for testing uh, this experience. Uh, at the time, they were approximately 6,000 salmon, 50 lobsters uh, at, the, at the bottom of the farm, and they were 50 meters plus uh, for fire species being cultivated and also uh, 200 meters of Valaria sculenta. The, the, the scallop shells with the Imantelia, we test two different uh, uh, acclimatization time start normally with what we do with kelp. Uh, we would uh, uh, put them in tanks with great aeration and water movement to make the, the small plantlets used to the conditions they will find at sea. Uh, but in here we test two. We, with some of them they follow this this uh, protocol, but others we kept them in the pristine conditions of no water movement and they went straight into the into the sea as well. Um, we put uh, we test two uh, deployment times with January and March. Although initially we were planning to put them a bit earlier in uh, December and February, but due to weather conditions and storms, uh, was impossible. And we also try two uh, depths at 0 0.5 and 1.2 meters. Today, I'm not going to analyze and look at these results. Is this something will come uh, hopefully in the coming months? Um, and you will, you will be able to, to uh, look at them in more detail. Uh, in here, you can see pictures of uh, some of the shells growing uh, in the farm. And also on the right hand side is a shell that some of the shells they were brought back to the same place where we took the parent plants and we stick them at the shore. And these are the growing, uh, the growth of Imanteria in there. Um, more pictures, these were towards the end of the trial. These are from uh, August and September. Um, and in the final, on the bottom picture, you can see the tongues already growing, which we were very happy to see that uh, we got to that stage. As you can see, all the way through was full of uh, epiphytes. They were present. Um, but the epiphytes, they didn't seem to, to overgrow the, the plants, uh, but clearly they compete uh, for a space. Um, and sometimes if Imantelia was getting detached, um, detached from the shell. Uh, these are from every month, uh, we took some destructive sampling that we measured and we brought back to the lab and all that is being analyzed at the moment. Uh, conclusions and observations. 
um, gametes were visible from March uh, and June. All plants were sexually differentiated. Eggs shed from late August, but we know that this is year dependent as we had a previous experience that uh, we could get some eggs earlier than that. Uh, visible eggs are, uh, the eggs are visible to the naked eye, which are, it's a species that is very pleasant to work with. Um, then the first deployment happened in January due to weather conditions. The acclimatization in our data tanks did not improve success after it seemed like the, the ones we put straight from very calm conditions, they, they were, um, they succeed as well although this still needs to be analyzed with more uh, attention. Um, the full uh, cycle, well, from the moment we brought them at sea, uh, they were the small buttons, uh, up to when the tongue, the receptacle grew, uh, it was eight months. And uh, epiphytes were present all the time, and, but did not destroy the plants, uh, but yes, compete for a space. And this uh, was a successful proof of concept, although we know now uh, we have to go back to the lab and uh, look at each stage uh, in a much more, uh, allowing more time to it and learn more and make this uh, cultivation uh, commercially available. Thank you very much. Uh, the next presentation in this uh, pilot action one is going to be uh, given again by uh, Jessica Ratcliffe of uh, National University of Ireland in Galway. So once again, uh, giving the floor to Jessica. Thanks, Eric. Okay, so hello again. Um, NUIG's remit within the pilot actions was to design and build a series of recirculating IMTA systems that could be used to trial different combinations of species. Um, but we were working with Lampsaka and Alva, um, and I'm going to give a very brief overview of the system and some of the trials we carried out. So I'm actually presenting on behalf of Maria Galindo, who was the student who carried out this work um, for her master's thesis. Um, and so all the credit should, should go to her. She's actually in this webinar right now, so you can also address questions to her. So, to introduce you, this is a picture of some of our lump suckers, which are a lovely species to work with, um, but because we didn't choose them entirely because they were cute, I will mention why we did choose them, um, both them and Alva, to work with. So, briefly, both species have economic value and are locally available. In the case of the lump suckers, there was a hatchery within NUIG that itself was set up because of the interest uh, in using them as a biological control of sea lice on farm salmon. In the case of Ulva, it has a high potential growth rate and therefore good remediation potential, um, which was also important in this case. And our design brief was um, to create eight independent uh, RAS units for two trophic levels with flexible flow rates and flexible lighting systems. So while we obtained our lump circles from the hatchery, um, we obtained Ulva from the wild and we didn't have enough time to build up uh, sufficient unialgal stocks. And so the composition of our cultures is, is shown here. We were working with both lamina and tubular morphologies. Uh, the dominant species of lamina was Ulva rigida and the dominant species of tubular was Ulva compressor. Uh, of course, ideally we would have worked with single species, but in the event we were lucky that both cultures were heavily dominated by one species. So, the master's project involved two parts. Um, the first was to design and build the systems and to get a good enough understanding of how they worked in practice. And the second was to run various experiments aimed at getting an idea of how different parameters affected the system and would affect the growth rates and remediation capacity of the ulva. So after much blood, sweat and tears, um, we arrived at, at this design that fitted both our needs and also the space we had available. So you, you can see on the left, a photo of one of the finished units that comprised a fish tank, three seaweed tanks with lighting directly above, a sump tank containing bacterial biofilter and a pump. Uh, the system also included particulate filtration, UV sterilization and aeration. And the overall water flow rate was modifiable both um, in itself and the rate going individually into each of the seaweed tanks. 
So we had a lot of control to play with parameters. On the right, uh, you can see a schematic showing the location of the sock filter, um, the pump system, the system pump, and uh, the four flow modification taps. And in this slide, you can see or partially see how they look in their location in the temperature controlled room in Kana Research Station in Connemara. And that's Maria working work. So having the eight independent units was great because it allowed us to conduct experiments with sufficient replication. And questions that we uh, initially asked were, what are the nutrient dynamics of the system? Um, does the ulva effectively utilize the nutrients provided by the fish and does this impact growth rate and seaweed composition in terms of carbon and nitrogen? Do the two morphologies behave the same or differently? And is there an interaction between them when they're co-cultivated? And how is the ulva growth and productivity affected by altering certain, certain parameters in the system? So um, you can see the summary of the uh, three experiments we did here, whether there were fish presence or absence. So initially we did um, experiments with fish in some systems and no fish in the other systems. Um, we then changed some of the environmental parameters um, to see what impacts this had. And in, in each case, we were looking at the growth rate and seaweed composition for each morphology of the lamin of the, the alva and for the mixed cultivation. And we were also looking at um, the water quality parameters of each compartment of the system. So there isn't that much time to go into detail, but of course there was a lot of work done in describing and understanding the system in terms of nutrient dynamics, fish growth, seaweed growth, and so forth. And here are a few examples of some of the results. So in experiment one, um, which was the experiment comparing systems with fish and systems without fish, so a very initial um, experiment, this shows growth rate of the alva um, in the IMTA system, which is the dark blue bars, and in the monoculture system, which are the light blue bars, according to whether it's lamina, tubular, or, or co-cultivated. Um, the first thing to notice is the growth rates are really, really poor for alva. Um, but the lamina does much better than the tubular. So the second experiment was a repeated ex experiment to try to improve the growth rates. A repeated experiment, but we um, doubled the light intensity. Again, you can see this had really no impact at all um, on the seaweed growth rates, but shows the same pattern. Lamina is much better than tubular. Um, this graph here, we're looking at percentage nitrogen, um, uh, percentage nitrogen at the beginning and end of the experiment. So light gray is the beginning and dark gray is the, the end of the experiment in the inter systems. In graph A and in graph B, it shows the non inter systems. So you can see as expected, the nitrogen content at the end of the experiments in the inter systems was, was uh, improved. And this last graph shows the carbon nitrogen ratio, which um, was also impacted as, as expected. And you can see that the ratio is, is low, it's decreased in the IMTA systems in graph A. So um, to uh, make some final remarks, um, the systems worked. And this may seem rather a basic factor to be, to be celebrating. But there was a huge learning curve involved for us and a huge amount of work in putting them together. And so I'd like to say um, a big thank you to the team at Kana, some of whom are pictured here, for the help in building them, and especially to Alex Wan and John, John Highland. We can say in general that the laminar alva was more suitable than tubular, um, perhaps because of the tendency of the tubular morphology to aggregate and clump together and get stuck in one section of the tank. Um, we can also say that growth rates in general are very low for ulva. And we don't know what the factor or factors causing this were, but some suggestions are written there on the, on the slide. So um, perhaps the photo period was too short or temperature was too low. Um, and we, we also noticed frequent sporulation events, which would, um, of course, destroy the, the ulva tissue. So we would have liked to keep looking into these. But of course, as soon as we were beginning to get a better handle on the system, we ran out of time to run more experiments. So I'm sorry to have been so brief, but if anybody wants more details, please feel free to contact Maria or me. Our emails are here. And if anybody would like to have a go with the systems for themselves, um, that's a possibility. They're available for use by 
uh, academic or industry researchers. So if you're interested, please contact Professor Mark Johnson and you have his email here also. So that's that's it for now. Um, thank you very much. And I'll pass back to Eric. For the next talk, we uh, cross the Atlantic and we're going to uh, France, to Brittany, Agro Campus West. Uh, and there, uh, Jamie Lutrangier will uh, talk about testing cultivation of oysters, sea cucumbers, and seaweed in a land based IMTA. So, I'm going to talk about the pilot action that we run here in Agro Campus West Begmay, in the site of Begmay, which is a site where we have an uh, aquaculture platform in the south of Brittany. <coughs> So in our third action, what we've done, it was to test the cultivation of, um, uh, of oysters, sea cucumbers, and seaweed in a land-based IMTA system. So um, the objective, the main objective of this pilot action was to monitor the performances, uh, to assess those performances on a land-based IMTA system. And as I said, using two different species, and here I'm going to explain you know, uh, what were the role of those each species in, the, in this ex experiment and why we chose them. So the first one uh, we can see here are oysters, Magdalena gigas, which uh, we used as an excretive species. So we expect this uh, organism to enrich uh, the seawater with nutrients. And then uh, the second component were sea cucumbers that are uh, known as deposit feeders. And the last component uh, was the extractive species, so this time um, primary producers with seaweed. So you're going to see we performed two experiments. So that's why here we had two different kinds of seaweed. So the first experiment was run with uh, Palmaria palmalta, or dulce, and the last one with ulva. So all these species share a common thing, which is that we can find each of these species locally. So it was very important for us to work with local species um, in South Brittany, in France, and also uh, with species that have uh, interesting and potentially important economic value. Uh, for example, oysters is oyster farming is the first uh, economic uh, the, the first farming of shellfish in France. So the, here you can see on this picture it's a picture uh, on, the, on this picture sorry it's the setting of the experiments. So you can see here you have like towers of four different tanks. Uh, the, the top tank is used for oysters. Uh, beneath this first one we have the sea cucumbers. Then the seaweed and the last one at the bottom were used as um, uh, a reservoir of water to be able to, to pump water on the top. So how I said, we, we performed two different experiments. So the main difference between those two experiments was the water flow. So in the first one, it was ex uh, an experiment using Palmaya Palmata where we had a float through. So we didn't uh, turn back the water after the seaweed back to the oysters. And on the contrary, on the experiment number two, um, we pen, uh, were in a recirculated system where the water from the seaweed, the outlets were pumped back to be used as an inlet. And as you can see here, uh, of course, we have to feed the, the, the feed the oysters. So to do so, we use phytoplankton. So here, what I'm showing are the different uh, settings of the experiments. And what you can see here in bold are the, what make the difference between two experiments. So what we get common are the phytoplankton. We're always using the same concentration and the same quantity of cells per oysters and per day. We have the same number of oysters. We uh, double the number of sea cucumber in the experiment number two. And daily to feed the sea cucumbers, what we've done it was at the same time every day we were transferring the, the feces produced by oysters to feed the to feed the sea cucumbers. Um, there, as you can see, we use different species of uh, seaweed between the experiment, different concentration, uh, different uh, light uh, um, light regime, different water flow, of course. And uh, the first experiment was a very short experiment, and the, the second one was a two weeks experiment. So, uh, in any of the experiments, what we were aiming it was to follow those chemical and physical parameters. So, the really basic one temperature, the pH, the, also the oxygen content, and ammonium and phosphate. 
So here are the results of the first experiment. So the first experiment, to remind you, is the one with Palmaya Palmata for four days uh, with a follow-through system. And here, as you can see, the pH as expected. You can see, so in the graph here on the top, you see the pH for the inlet here. Yeah? So the water is coming inside, arriving in the, in the system with phytoplankton. Then oysters, so the water after going through the oysters, sea cucumbers, and seaweed. So as you can see, so we have minor acidification, even if it's not uh, significant. Um, after the oysters, we still have, we don't have change uh, in the pH between oysters and sea cucumbers. But what is interesting here is you can see that after seaweed, we have uh, a basification, which is significant. And it's probably driven by uh, the CO2 content. So as expected, um, we, we, we have a CO2 consumption uh, with animals. So a, a decrease in the pH and a CO2 uh, consumption, sorry, production by, by animals and consum consumption by seaweed, which is uh, current with the pH uh, evolution. And then if we check the, the oxygen contents in the different tanks, as you can see, as expected, so we have oxygen consumption by animals. We don't see actually uh, that much change with sea cucumbers. And if we look close, closely, we can see a slightly increase in oxygen level, which is not really expected. But overall, when we see the oxygen contents after the seaweed, we can see that we have, even if it's not significant, but we tend to have slightly more oxygen uh, produced than oxygen that is used using this system. And then we have two final um, parameters, which were uh, ammonium and phosphate. As you can see here is that animals uh, tend to enrich the seawater with those um, nutrients, as expected. And <clears throat> what we can see is that seaweed uh, decrease slightly this, uh, those nutrients. So they are partially removed. So what we can conclude in experiments is that we have a reoxygenation re by Palmaria palmata. We can see that uh, famous cucumbers was a success, so they were really like really enjoying it. And then the radiation was partial because not all the ammonium and phosphate was to removed from the system. So, uh, so we had good things of this experiment, but because it was a short experiment, we had few limits. So, for example, it was pretty hard to monitor the biomass. Because in four days, it was pretty difficult to follow the, the biomass of oysters and chicken cucumbers, of course, and, uh, and, and seaweed. And so I, I said the sea cucumbers were happy with the feces from oysters, but we don't know in the long term if they will appreciate it. And of course, it's a flow through uh, system, which is maybe not really, um, um, really a, a perfect IMTS system. So that's why we, we perform the second experiment where we have recirculated system. So basically the, the parameters were the same, except that for the density with seaweed was very really low uh, compared to the Palmaya Palmata. And uh, so here we follow the same experiment and unfortunately for the ammonium and phosphates uh, analysis were delayed uh, because of the recent context. And so here I'm going to present you the, um, only the pH and oxygen variation in the second experiment. So as you can see uh, before that we have an acidification uh, after the oysters. So pro um, it's probably due to the CO2 uh, production. <coughs> but in single color and seaweed, we can see that the pH is pretty stable uh, compared to oysters, which was uh, not really expected. So then when we follow the oxygen, we can see that oysters, as before, consume oxygen. We can see a slight increase in oxygen content after the sea cucumbers, and the same for seaweed. So when we take those two rules uh, all together, we can like think there's two hypotheses to explain that. So wh why do we have an increase in oxygen with sea cucumbers? So I think my ba the best clue is because of the water motion of the saving of the different tanks, the water was dropped, uh, dropping into the tank. So I think it was um, a way to reoxygenate the water due to the water motion. And uh, if I was in the sea, we did, I think we have the same effect from the water motion. So we have a better oxygen content thanks to this water motion. 
but uh, we can also hypothesize that it's from the photosynthesis, but when we see the pH level after the seaweed, I'm not sure it's the best hypothesis to explain this oxygen content. Uh, in this time, so it was a two-week experiment and we followed the biomass and it was a, a very low uh, biomass increase, so 11% plus 11% in two weeks, which is pretty low. When we compare to the bibliography, we can have up to 10% a day, so we're pretty far from that. And yes, uh, so now I have to conclude. I have time. It's okay. So the conclusion is that uh, even if we use some non-domesticated uh, animals like the sea cucumbers, Olotoria foscali, uh, we can say that it's a good candidate as a benthic species for MTA in Europe. Uh, we still have to analyze that, but I think there is a good potential in the economic value of this species. And even for the two weeks experiments, the sea cucumbers were feeding uh, on, the, on the feces of oysters. And also, uh, what is very important is we, we, we have to take into account when we want to set up an IMT system, uh, the seasonality and the barometration capacity of economic value, uh, economic value for the, the, the choice of species. So, for example, if we see with the Palmaria palmata, we'd be more a species that uh, we'll tend to use during the, the winter. And on the contrary, Ulva will be more used during the summer. Um, also, for the bioremediation, I think the family setup is very important. As we can see, that the water motion can really help re oxygenate the water. And we can use these abiotic uh, parameters to help uh, the, the, the IMTS system. So, to go a bit further, it's really interesting to, uh, to go a bit deeper in the, in the density, uh, to, to work on the densities of animals and also seaweed to see what have the optimal densities between compartments to have a, a good system. And then it would be really nice because here we, we have a very tiny experiment on four tanks. Uh, we have a way to scale up the system and to get a more precise idea what is the economic value of such a system. So thank you for listening me, to me. So if you have any question, feel free to ask me. Uh, the next presentation is going to be delivered by an uh, associated partner. It's uh, an external testimonial. And it's uh, for a change. It's on a freshwater IMTA system. It's going to be presented by uh, Damien Toner from BMI in Ireland. So Damien, I'm going to uh, hand over the screen to you. Okay, thanks for the opportunity um, to explain a bit about this project that we've been working on. Um, so. I work for BIM, which is Ireland's seafood development agency. Uh, we're involved in aquaculture and uh, fisheries development. So I'm just going to present a bit about a freshwater uh, trial that we've been working on called Aquamona, which is a, a FIMTA project. So it's a freshwater IMTA system. And it's the culmination probably of about five years work we've been doing on, on uh, IMTA systems in freshwater. And this project arises out of some work that was done in the United States on split pond systems. So uh, the project is based on cutaway peatland in Ireland. So in Ireland, in the Midlands, you have this area of peatland, which is obviously the remnants of, of uh, forests. And you have these large peatlands that have been built up. And we're working with a state-owned company called Board Namona, which owns around 80,000 hectares of these peatlands. So this area was traditionally used for peat harvesting, for heating homes and uh, electricity generation. And obviously, uh, given climate change and environmental legislation, this practice is not really environmentally sustainable. So these lands are now being utilized for diversification projects. So some of these projects include forestry, tourism and amenity. Uh, there's also some agricultural activity and wind energy and some biodiversity projects. So uh, as I said, the, it's, uh, the site is based in the Midlands of Ireland, about uh, one hour from, from Dublin. And it's based at Mount Lucas Wind Farm. So the wind farm itself is on approximately 1,000 hectares. There is 26 wind turbines and it provides enough power for around 40,000 homes. So um, 
we decided to locate the project at this site because of access to energy and uh, fresh water. And obviously, as you can see, space is not, is not an issue either. So the, the project itself is run in conjunction with a number of different partners. Um, it's a 35 ton license. So it's a commercial trial for organic production of perch, trout and duckweed. And the aim is, if successful, that the trial will be ex expanded into a full commercial farm. So the farm itself is on around 5.4 hectares of that 1,000 hectare site. So BIM and Bordenamona jointly project, uh, manage the project. And as I said, the trial is undertaken with a variety of partners, including UCC, uh, which is a university which is uh, coordinating the duckweed work. Goldsbridge Trout Farm, which is a commercial trout farm in Ireland, and Keywater Fisheries, which produces perch. We also have a number of projects running with other third level institutes and other state agencies. So it's it's really a multi partner approach to try and, and make the trial success. So this is just an overview of uh, the farm shortly after construction. Um, so. You can see here we have uh, four ponds uh, in which fish are contained, and they're contained in, in what we call the DNs, so in, in these ends of the ponds here. And then this area in between is for water treatment. So we're utilizing algae and bacteria in these areas to treat the, treat the ammonia produced by the fish. And in, in addition, the water is also circulated around about once every six hours through this duckweed area down here and then comes back up into each pond. So it's like a recirculation system, but obviously outdoors. We also have a reservoir here in case we need um, access to water. In general, after the system is filled, uh, water supply uh, entirely comes from rainfall. So there hasn't been any requirement to take any new water into site, apart from periods during the summer when you have high evaporation and the system level drops. So the duckweed channels, which are slightly shallower than the, the ponds and the rest of the system, is like a labyrinth or a maze. So water slowly um, moves through uh, the duckweed channels and then back into the pond system. And obviously duckweed doesn't really like high flowing water. So uh, that's why the exchange rate between this part of the system and here is, is generally a slow, a slow moving water rate. So the farm began operation in September of um, 2019, and the project will run, or 2018, and the project will run until September of this year. We're already looking at ways to maybe extend the project for another year. Um, we use airlifts to move the water around site. So we looked at a number of different methods for moving water, and airlifts we found were the most um, energy efficient way of doing that. Um, so they move around 80 litres a second um, of water in, in each pond, and that creates flow for the fish and al also creates flow to remove um, waste nutrients. Uh, results to date are very encouraging. We're learning all the time. Obviously, when you're working outdoors, you're, you're, you're exposed to seasonal differences. So the weather can be different from one year to the other. So it's about managing the system as much as possible within those constraints. As I mentioned, discharge is minimal and has been primarily just during rainfall events. I suppose the ethos of this project is to have a sustainable system where all the nutrients are managed and to close the loop. So it really is about whatever nutrients are put in the system to try and remove in some way, either through fish harvesting or to harvesting the duckweed. Um, algae is very efficient at converting um, the ammonia and the nitrogen into biomass, but it's a much harder um, component to harvest than duckweed. And that's why the emphasis has, has largely been on, on duckweed. Although, although we use algae and duckweed in the system, the duckweed is much easier to harvest. This is another overview of the farm, just to give you an idea of the scale. So I think down the corner here, you can see a car. Um, this is the turbine that provides all the power. The total energy usage uh, per hour 
on site is around 15 kilowatts. This is primarily um, primarily used by the airlifts, but also um, we have emergency paddle wheels should the oxygen in the system drop below 70%, the paddle wheels will turn on. This generally happens during the summer when we have high algal concentrations and obviously at night the oxygen level drops. This is a closer view of the duckweed area, um, again, shortly after construction. Um, the, the depth of these channels is about 0.6 of a meter. And then this is July of last year. So last year we got up to about 70% coverage of duckweed in the duckweed area. Um, and uh, in this photograph, we have about 40% coverage. So the, the main, um, I suppose, challenge for duckweed growth in this area is wind. So it being a wind farm, it's not unnatural to expect a lot of wind. And we, we do tend to get a lot of wind on site and it will tend to push the duckweed down the channels and it gathers. And when it gathers, it, it will tend to die off. So you'll see it become a bit yellow in some of these areas. So we, we've created these floating barriers across the channels, which is just pipework that floats and it helps to, to restrain the duckweed in an area and stops it uh, floating down. Now, I would imagine over time, as you get growth on these banks, which has happened this year, you will see a much more sheltered area for the duckweed. And um, this is a, a closer look then from August last year, the duckweed area, you can see pretty much full coverage. Um, duckweed is, is, is a great plant for use in this system because it grows quite fast. It can double every 24 hours. Um, we've harvested it and dried it and we've got a protein content of about 40%. So it is potential for use in animal feeds. It's also been used before in pharmaceutical and in the cosmetic industry. It absorbs ammonia directly. So it's not waiting until it, it goes through a nitrification process. It's, it's taking the ammonia directly from the fish, which is obviously um, a great asset. So we have a floating uh, scum skimmer that we use to harvest this duckweed. It floats and it pumps the duckweed out from the top of the system into a harvesting tank. And from there it can be dried and utilized. So in this way, we're, we're, we're removing the nutrients that we're putting in in terms of fish feed. We're removing them from, from the duckweed area. Okay, sorry, Daniel, say, to interrupt. Yeah. Can you please come to a conclusion? We're yeah, sorry, sorry. Yeah. yeah. So this is, again, an overview showing the algae in the system uh, in the reservoir. Um, these are some of the fish that we've produced, um, some nice rainbow trout and uh, perch. Uh, the growth rate of the trout has been exceptional. We've, we've got fish up to three kilos within, uh, within five months for 400 grams. We use, uh, utilize some uh, drone technology to measure the density of the duckweed in the system, um, which proves uh, very efficient in calculating the volumes. And we're also, as, as in any system, tracking ammonia and phosphates and, and nutrients. Uh, so just briefly to sum up, our greatest challenge at the moment really is in trying to uh, optimize this nutrient loop and manage algae, duckweed, and cyanobacteria within the system. And it's about trying to manage that efficiently is, is the biggest challenge. Um, and that's pretty much it. Thank you very much.